So in, in, the, um, uh, in the abstract, in the flyer, et cetera, you might have seen my affiliation uh, sort of associated with Mount Sinai, but sort of things have changed since I accepted the talk and, and sort of today when I'm given the talk. And I sort of joined this very large company called Stay at Home Dads uh, for the time being. I left Mount Sinai about a couple of months ago, um, and I'm working on my startup while I'm, I'm home with my kids. Um, so that's just for, for full disclosure. Uh, the next item of business is that obviously this is uh, collaborative work. We're, I'm going to talk about sort of two, two or three papers um, with one sort of paper that anchors these, th these techniques, but this is sort of joint work with uh, my great colleagues, Dr. Aaron Baum, uh, Joseph Scarpa, who was a postdoc in my group, uh, Emily, Patrick, and Sanjay Basu, who is my friend at Stanford University. So this is not the entire group, but when I was CTO uh, at Mount Sinai, uh, I led both data science research and products, so we have a blend of sort of PhD level researchers, but we also have UX designers, developers, et cetera, et cetera. So unfortunately, I don't have that much time, and I also burned through a few minutes, uh, put in some context here, but I wanted to sort of put out some great resources that sort of do much more justice to this interesting topic than I will ever will in the next 40 minutes. Uh, one of them is a great uh, tutorial by uh, David Sontag at uh, MIT and Yuri Shalit at uh, Technion. So if you just Google uh, ICML causal inference tutorial, it'll come up. Um, sort of a lot of the work that I'll be talking is based on uh, Susan Athey's uh, causal forest, obviously, so there's a great tutorial on that as well that she gives uh, at KDD and elsewhere. Stefan Wager, who sort of is the developer uh, of the library, it's on GitHub, is fantastic. Most of the stuff, as I mentioned, is from this paper. Horrible title, very long, but it was in a medical journal, so to our defense, we had to sort of fit the audience there. Um, and the source code for our method, which just really borrows from the makes calls to that library that I mentioned above, is, is here at GitHub. So for today, I wanted to, to spend time on three things, sort of some context around the work that we do and why we pursued this particular problem, and just some sort of uh, musings to my fellow data scientists in light of sort of this morning's panel. So I added this actually last minute. Um, talk about the methods about causal forests and, and what makes them interesting but also maddening at the same time, and the application to clinical trials data. <laughs> so for context, I want to touch on quickly on three things, sort of the context around data, where we stand with respect to methods and users, and how the users fit into our everyday lives. So for, for context, uh, for data, there's this term. I don't think I invented this term, although I used it in this, in this paper back uh, two, two, three years ago, of data empathy, where increasingly data scientists, and this is how we learn data science, right? We go to the UCI, UCI repository, we download the data set, we run the algorithms on it, and then when we get more adventurous, we start solving our own problems. We go and scrape Reddit, we go and scrape Medium. We try to build our own data sets and start doing sort of hacking away at predictive modeling. What happens is that the data scientist today is farther and farther and farther removed from a data generation process unless you work at a big internet company. And even then, it's, it's still very hard to get to people who are collecting the data. And that puts us in a lot of trouble because we don't understand why the data was collected, how, and, and for what necessarily purpose at that time. And uh, there's a fun story about this team that was analyzing web blogs, and they found out after publishing and doing all these analyses that some, for some random reason, they turned off the logging between 6 and 8 a.m. because there was low traffic. And now you have a, a significantly biased data set that you just never knew about until an intern sort of fiddled around with the exploratory data analysis. So that, that, that's one thing, is that I would hope that in the next few years, and as you guys start startups, graduate from school, really focus on getting closer and closer and closer to the data source to really gain that empathy into what the data we are analyzing and for what purpose, for us to build these promising methods and, and bring these promising methods really to the forefront of what we do. Um, the next thing is methods, and sort of, we come from a history of, uh, uh, of scientific discoveries. Obviously, started a millennia ago, where we looked just at observation, observing natural phenomena. We went into theoretical. Anybody who put an put a equation out a few years ago, a formula out a few years ago, won a Nobel, because it just helped us generalize these observations. Then we moved to sort of more computational simulations, and, and probably the last century or so, we looked at the data-driven approaches, and most recently, this big data approach. But what has happened, what I've noticed now, especially with people graduating more recently, is this issue that we have, we believe in this unreasonable effectiveness of data. So this is this notion that if I have sufficiently large amounts of data, I am able to really reconstruct fundamental 
uh, understandings about these data without having underlying theory. That is, I could just mine the data enough that it will tell me everything I need to know about the world. And, and obviously this is sort of correct in certain areas where I'm not interested in building a theory, but it, it falls short in other domains as I'll show. And instead, really the main thing that I wanted to put uh, for background is that the way we have to think about knowledge discovery today from data specifically is that it's a multi-methods multi approach, that we have the experimentation, we have the simulations, we have the theories, we have the inference, and we have the machine learning, we have the big data. It's, it's an essential tool, but it's not the only tool. And I foresee that in the future, the greatest breakthroughs are gonna come from this sort of multi-approach uh, to learning. Um, and a good example of that is the Higgs boson when it was discovered, it was a combination of sort of theory, running large-scale simulations, but also doing big data on top of that. And, and this is, I think, the way it's gonna go. And finally, sort of how, does, how do users fit into our day-to-day -day routine? And I think this is something that has been a challenge for me, at least, um, especially coming from academia, is that um, we give a pass to data scientists because of this, the difficult technical problems. We say, great job, that was a very challenging uh, technical problem but we do it at the expense of the user experience, at the expense of actually solving a real problem that thousands or millions of users need. Um, and I think what I've learned the hard way, unfortunately, is that unless you solve for a particular pain, then you are really just setting up yourself to write a great paper, and that's, that's as far as it goes. And that's what happened to me uh, early on in my career. I got lots of great papers, won best paper awards, like probably like 12 reads. That's it, uh, unfortunately. So, so basically, just to, to summarize, I think these are the, the, the context in which we are doing data science today that needs to change. The first one is that we need to get closer to the data source. We need to understand the how, the what, and the why of data collection and data generation process. I think in the few, while machine learning sort of is, is what we're talking about today, it is only one part of this, this very sort of complex toolkit for us to do knowledge discovery in, in large data sets. And sort of finally, unless we're addressing a problem and we fit within a user's context, people are not gonna adopt our tools. What I mean by that, for example, if you're doing an AI tool for a physician um, and you don't understand that a physician only sees a patient for 10 minutes and that's it, and you're expecting them to pay attention to your tool for another 12 minutes, like it's not gonna fly. Like really, you need to fit within their context and what they're doing. So that brings my rent to a close, but I thought I'll, I'll put that sort of about how we're approaching these problems on a larger scale. So, one thing that I wanted to bring up about sort of how we, we learn data science, we download these data sets and we use them, and now there's this sort of fad about open data portals, it's great, we use them to analyze them. But I think clinical trials is a great opportunity for data scientists. Why? Because people spend a lot of time curating them. They, spend, they, they use what's considered the golden standard of experimentation to produce these data sets. So I mean, you can't pay more attention to data generation than that, more or less. Um, number two, there's an increasing, increasingly large repository of such data. There are clinicaltrials.gov, you go there, hundreds upon hundreds of clinical trials. They don't, they don't ask the same question, but actually if you were interested in diabetes, you could find lots of clinical trials now on diabetes, on heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and similarly, so there are other randomized control trials outside of the healthcare system, so for policy, et cetera, that also exist. And finally, it's a large and growing industry. And what we're talking about, $40 billion a year expected to grow year to year about six to 10% annually, right? So for those that are thinking about startups, a lot of things are already laid out in front of you, uh, especially in terms of the data assets and the questions that people are interested in. So the question that we're trying to tackle is, can we, identi so can we identify heterogeneous treatment effects in clinical trials? And HCEs are very important because they enable us to identify subgroups that might have benefited or been harmed by an intervention despite the entire population seeming like there was no benefit, right? Um, so, and, and I'm putting it in this particular potentially clinical way, but obviously at the end what we're saying is just audience segmentation, right? I'm trying to segment my audience to be able to show them the right ad, apply the right policy, et cetera, et cetera. But in this case, it has a, a medical bent or clinical trial bent. So what's gonna drive some of this conversation are these two case studies. These are very large, very expensive uh, randomized trial. So on the left, you have the look ahead trial uh, that was interested in looking at if intense lifestyle interventions uh, impacted uh, obese people with, di with type 2 diabetes. Did, were they better off if we had an in, an, uh, a strong lifestyle intervention where you would help them exercise, where you will give them medication, et cetera, et cetera. 
And what they found is that after a few years, they discontinued it because if you look at that curve on the top uh, right, I guess, uh, you see that the control and the intervention, actually, the outcomes were almost identical. So they said, th there's no point in continuing this expensive trial. Instead of going 10 years, I'm just going to stop after four. On the, the next panel here, the SPRINT trial was looking at since uh, blood pressure is associated with all sorts of adverse outcomes, uh, stroke, cardiovascular disease, et cetera, they decided to see if we strongly monitored and aggressively reduced blood pressure, would that make a difference? Would we have better health outcomes? And the results were actually, they, were, they stopped every three years because the result was so obvious. Yes, if I, have a, if I control this uh, aggressively and I reduce blood pressure, I tend to do better across uh, a variety of outcomes. So that's awesome, great. Um, so now the question is, well, are there subgroups in these two trials that may have disproportionately benefited or been harmed by these interventions? That's the question that we're interested in. So how do we identify HTEs currently? Well, there are, there are a few ways. The first one is, uh, and the most common one, is pre-registration. So before I run my clinical trial, I'm going to say at the conclusion of this trial, I will investigate males that are African-American and made less than $36,000 a year if I collected such information. Um, but, and they do maybe three or four of these sort of subpopulations that they're going to analyze. This is, this is great because now you are not doing multiple hypothesis testing. You are not, you're pre-registering these experiments. On the other hand, the computer scientists say, well, why don't you just exhaustively search through the space of subpopulations, right? So I'm just doing multiple hypothesis testing on steroids. These are sort of the two extremes uh, of this problem. Um, and so, and when this is untenable is as the number of features grow. So when people start introducing things like Fitbits and wearables, when people start looking at personal information, like people are making a push, like, can I look at your emails, in addition to your weight and your height and, and your ethnicity. Um, as you add more and more and more and more dimensions, it's going to be increasingly more difficult for a clinician to pre-register a meaningful subpopulation. So can we find a happy medium that accounts for this growing in the number of data sets and the gro growth in the number of features while finding statistically significant subpopulations that may benefit or be harmed from an intervention that on average seems to have no effect or maybe positive or negative. So the way we, we looked at this, and there are many ways to approach now this problem, uh, it starts out just by looking at how machine learning algorithms work. So obviously, machine learning, the way it works is that I'm trying to minimize an objective function, a law, minimize or optimize an objective function, in this case a loss, we minimize it, over uh, family functions, so trees, uh, et cetera, networks, and subject to some regularization where I'm going to penalize you for complexity. I don't want your model to be overly complex relative to the data that you have. Makes sense. Um, so, but when you take this particular approach in a uh, causal inference aspect, because what I'm trying to understand is, would you benefit or be harmed by an intervention? And more importantly, for example, let's assume do, if I give you aspirin, you get better or you don't get better. Not only I want to know if I give you aspirin, do you improve, but would you actually regress if I didn't give you aspirin? That's why we can't do this. We can't A-B test on the real world, unfortunately, because there's only one version of each one of us. Um, but the main, and historically how we've been doing this, and I used to do that many years ago as well, is that in a typical setting where I have my X's, which are these features that I collected about patients, my Y's, which are these outcomes, for example, did you just die or, or survive? But then we have an intervention, W, did I give you the aspirin or not? One or zero, it's a binary event. What usually we do, we just tack it to the X's. Um, and there are many problems with that setting and why that does not give us optimal models. But most importantly, why it doesn't do it, especially in the case when we're looking at trees where we're trying to partition a feature space, is that you'll find these pockets in the partition, right, that will, have, that will all fall under one kind of W, either all uh, got an intervention or all didn't get an intervention. So now you can't measure, actually, the treatment effect. That's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in predicting an outcome. I'm trying to understand the treatment effect. And this goes back to the panel discussion about, am I building a method for the right outcome that I'm trying to measure? And that's what we try to do here. That's why we went with this particular approach by Susan Athey and Stephen Wager, because we believe that it sort of fit what we were trying to do best. Before I proceed, there are many, many ways how to find subpopulation in observational data. There are people who have done to extended lasso approaches, deep instrumental variables. We're looking at causal trees, causal forests, but there are many, many approaches. And in fact, I was trying to find uh, this great review of sort of subpopulation identification 
But unfortunately, I couldn't access my old work email, so it's, it's in the ether somewhere. I'll have to find it, but please email me, and I'll, I'll, I'm happy to connect there. But what's also exciting is that there are a lot of people here in New York City working on this problem. Obviously, Adam here has a great package on uh, causal inference on GitHub, but there's also David Bly and his former student, Rajesh, who's now at David Bly, he's here at Columbia, Rajesh at NYU, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are people here, John Lankford, who's here also in New York City. These folks are working on this, so you guys could just like hop on the subway and meet these experts in this, in this particular merging field. So I'm gonna go quickly through this, unfortunately, because I can't do it justice. But the idea here that, that Susan Nathy proposed in her great uh, PNAS paper, uh, that sort of the, the algorithms are based on, is that she figured that there is a way for us to transform that optimization, that function that I'm trying, that objective function that I'm trying to optimize from a mean squared error to maximizing the intergroup uh, heterogeneous uh, treatment effect uh, between groups. So I'm trying, to max, I'm trying to identify groups that will get different, extreme different responses at one treatment or another. Um, and so what they did basically, the setup here, as I said, is a little bit different because we have this W, which is the intervention. Uh, so now I have an observation, whether you survived or not, or whether you got healthy or not, as a function of an intervention, one or zero. Um, and what she was able to show, what I'll just spare the details of, but what she was able to show is that actually one way to look at the heterogeneous treatment effects is simply to subtract similar users uh, or participants who got the intervention minus those that didn't get the intervention. That's the mu 1x minus mu 0x. Um, and basically, she transformed her objective function from a traditional mean squared error to this one where she, she gets this treatment effect, she subtracts it from the observed uh, outcome. Uh, so it, it works in certain cases, it doesn't work in others, but since here we are really trying to maximize the heterogeneous effect, the extreme response of two populations, this actually works quite well for us in practice. There was one problem, however, and, and sort of this is, this is a problem that we're still struggling with despite these publications, is that on the one hand, trees are extremely unstable, right? Depending on how, what kind of data set I give it, it will give me a different tree every time. So uh, Leo Bryman and others proposed this notion of forest, and somebody right here today was saying that ensemble methods always win, right? So gradient boosted forests, you put it in any competition, is one of the top algorithms. The problem with, with ensembles is that they're not interpretable. Like I can't do anything with them except make a prediction, and this is not what I'm interested in doing. So how can we get the stability at, that we get from introducing more variability from sort of sample bootstrapping the samples? while still remaining interpretable that I get from a single unstable tree. So here we, this was a sort of more of a heuristic that we use, but this is an active field of research that we're pursuing now, is can we come up with a notion of a tree centrality or a graph centrality, people talk about that. So if I have an ensemble of trees, what tree represents most accurately the, the behavior of the ensemble? Um, and what we did here basically uh, to give you sort of uh, an analogy, if we were to take everybody in the amphitheater and sort us by height, we're just gonna ask the person, who is the closest person to the average height of this entire amphitheater? That was, that was the idea. And basically what we did, we found one representative tree that performed similar to the ensemble average and had most of the features that were included in that tree. It's not great and there is no sort of guarantees. We don't have any sort of guarantees on this particular heuristic. But sort of from a practical standpoint, that's why I want to talk about this because it combines the practicality of sort of uh, some of the folks that are working more on, in industry, the practicality of data science with the research nature of data science as well, sort of bringing them together like this morning people were talking about uh, in the panel. So let's go back to the look ahead study. So the look ahead study asked this question, uh, do people benefit from an extreme lifestyle intervention? If I, if I helped, if I coached you, if I made you exercise more, eat better, would, would you improve? Um, and people said no. So, but then when we ran our algorithm on it, we got a tree that actually said no, there are extreme responses to this intervention. And what we found is, is that there are groups that tend to have poor mental health and poor baseline health when they enter the study actually are responding severe, uh, are responding negatively to the intervention. But they get masked because they're a minority, they get masked by the population level average. So what we found is that, so in that tree, in that breakdown there, you find that 85% actually benefit from the intervention, which is a shame, because we had sound scientific evidence 
that having an intense lifestyle intervention could help a large number of people who are starting off poorly. These are obese patients with type 2 diabetes. So they are sort of far along uh, in, 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 a, in a negative outcome, and we are bringing them back, which is great. But the 15% mask that. And, and so what I wanted to also point out here in this study, what this tree does for you, it just identifies the subgroups. It doesn't do anything else, right? So number one, you have to, so what you have to do is you have to make sure that you're identifying the subgroups correctly. You're not biased. You're not overfitting in that sense. Um, but then you need another approach to actually validate your results. How do I independently validate that these groups are actually real or significant or have any meaning? So what we did since we were working uh, sort of in more of a health domain epidemiology, we used the Cox model, just a simple survival analysis. We took the groups, the two groups, and we looked at how likely are there to experience an adverse event at time t, and t increases uh, by year. So here it's between zero and 10 years. And what you see is, is if you look at the rightmost panels, you have subgroup one, where you had the uh, control group actually doing worse than the intervention group, right? Which is good. That means that people who did, did this intense, intensive lifestyle intervention improved. But then, as you can see in subgroup two, the, the curves flip. The blue improved, but the red didn't improve. In this case, sort of the control did better than the intervention. And these are the folks, as I mentioned, that, that started out with poor health and had uh, scored highly in some uh, mental health, uh, scored poorly in some mental health questionnaires. So what, it, what is the takeaway message from here? It's simple as that. Well, had they administered this simple survey prior to the trial, they could have weeded out certain patients and they could have assigned them to the right group. And what was interesting about this, this paper that made us smile is that when it got published, the people that ran the original look-ahead study wrote a commentary about our paper, welcoming sort of us looking, looking again at this, at this look-ahead trial. So uh, that was encouraging for the team and, and, and for myself. Now, if you go to the SPRINT study, we said if you aggressively uh, control blood pressure, does that improve health outcomes? It seems that yes, people high-fived each other, they discontinued it, but then what we found, same story, is that actually, yes, for the majority, there was a lot of people whose uh, outcomes sort of improved, but then there were people who had a sign flip. There was a subgroup of people, and these are people who smoke. People who smoked a lot and got this, this intervention actually did worse than the people, than, than the average population. Uh, and this is sort of not a, a small group. What we found out is that they're actually four times, almost four times more likely to get kidney injury, acute kidney injury, based on this intervention. Uh, so this was significant, especially if you're trying to run a clinical trial. Um, and this, this paper has not been published yet, it's under review at the moment. Uh, but to, to summarize, what this really comes down to is that we found that there are some clinical trials that have been reported to have zero uh, effect to actually find a large subgroup that actually got benefits from it that we just missed because we, we wiped them out in, in a large population average. Similarly, we, we found that there were others where there was uh, a benefit, a strong benefit actually, endorsed by the, the people that ran the study. However, there were subgroups that actually were harmed from this, from this intervention. Um, and what gets me excited about this and what we're trying to do next is that this really shows a new way to this enrich this conversation of precision medicine. So for those of you uh, that are familiar with this, uh, precision medicine sort of is like big data. Like everybody uses that word, nobody knows what the hell it means in practice. Uh, but generally speaking, what people, when they say precision medicine, they mean combining clinical data with genetic data. Can I take these two data sets, put them together, and do something better than with either data set alone? And that's great, but I'm skeptical that actually genetics are going to take you that far. So for example, we know here if you live, in, if you live at, the, at the intersection between uh, sort of Upper East Side and East Harlem, right, just one block separates you, your chances of dying of cancer doubles, right? So we know that genetics cannot explain these. There's a lot of contextual factors that actually we need to introduce to precision medicine. But one, one thing that we can do as data scientists is to actually introduce new and better suited methods to the precision medicine toolbox. So this is one, one sort of example of this, a small example, but if we had the same number of data scientists working in this space, 
compared to other spaces, if we've got that critical mass, we will see, I think, a lot of convergence and a lot of growth quite rapidly. And I think this is a great avenue for actually startups because I think academia has some barriers that makes it difficult to break through here compared to in a startup where now the barriers are to entry are quite low. So I wanted to um, wrap up with some just some, some caveats there is that obviously this is a, a relatively new approach. Very unstable. We had a lot of hard times at first getting the model to run. There's a new package on GitHub, uh, the generalized uh, forests uh, package that I showed earlier. I have not used that, full disclosure. I think it's like an alpha or some, some really early stage uh, of production, but still I think it's very useful uh, to look at those. I think there's a large body of subgroup identification that we just haven't explored yet. They might be better suited methods. One person that I forgot to mention is uh, uh, Daniel Neal at uh, NYU. He used to be at CMU and he moved to NYU. Great guy, working in this space from a different perspective. Uh, I encourage you to check out his work. Um, and the big challenge that we had was that a lot of times these algorithms will find small subgroups, right? So when I'm doing my splits, I could force it to say each leaf should have a bucket size of X. That's great, um, but obviously that, as any time you put some random parameter, then you're biasing your algorithm some way or another. Um, so what we focused on are extreme events where there's a sign flip, but there could be more subtle events, especially in uh, subtle effects, especially in other domains potentially, like I mentioned earlier, policy or advertising, et cetera, where maybe we don't need, we might be missing a big opportunity if we don't look at smaller effects, not these extreme ones, but for now we only focus on sort of sign flips. Um, and as I mentioned before, sort of one of the challenges that we're facing is that we love ensemble models, but we are having a hard time figuring out how to summarize an ensemble model. Ironically, Pedro Dominguez had a great paper about this subject back like 1998. Um, I, I'm happy to, to send that paper as well, where he, what he did, he learned the forest, and then he sort of learned the tree that summarizes the forest. It was an interesting approach. I think he abandoned that technique, but still, he was one of the early folks to think about this problem, and I encourage others to think about it because I, I think it's going to come up off more often, especially as we explore new domains, medicine, uh, insurance, et cetera, et cetera, where the models have to be interpretable to have an impact. Um, with that, I am, it seems early, which is good, and I can take uh, questions, and I'll also be at the party and the uh, office hour. And please feel free to text me today and tomorrow. I'm around. Um, I'm happy to get uh, together with people. Thank you. That's my wrong email. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. I, th I found it very interesting. Thank um, you. <clears throat> I have two questions. Um, the first is, how did you, so in the two studies you showed that you are, were identifying subgroups, uh, were you joining on features that were not in the original study, or were those, all those features that you were identifying subgroups were in the original study to begin with? All, we, we did a, a pure reanalysis. We just downloaded data. As a, so I should have mentioned, sorry, uh -huh. the sprint data challenge, the, the second study that we showed, there was, uh, sorry, the sprint data analysis that we did uh, came out of a community challenge that the New England Journal of Medicine uh, sort of commissioned. Okay. And we were one of the, the entrants in there. We just took those results and, and, and put them in there. But so the data was there. It was collected uh, at, and we analyzed it as is. Cool. Um, and then the second question. So I was confused when you were describing uh, your method of like finding the uh, like the graph central tree or the tree that like, <clears throat> like best fit the accuracy of the ensemble, because uh, isn't a key feature of random forests that they like subselect columns? So there's Correct. no such thing as a tree that captures all the features. Correct. So yeah. So we we looked at basically if we were to summarize. If you were to objectively summarize the performance of each tree by, by a single metric, it's not great. Um, can you find a tree that has, uh, that has a similar performance to the, to the ensemble, basically? That, that's what we did. Um, and what happens is that usually you'll find trees that are very comparable. Uh, uh, maybe one is the single best, but it's like by a few percentage points or whatever it is. So it's not statistically significant. So what we did there, we, we, we cheated a little bit in the sense that we looked at the top performance. We took the, most, the top performing one, but there were others that were top K, if you will. Um, and, and we looked at those as well, but it seemed like the same features were appearing every time. So we, we actually tried to do that at first, where we would just count 
how many times each feature sort of, and we weighed those features as, as importance, we found them not to be very helpful. So we just chose one that sort of performed, be, that performed closest, not necessarily the best, but performed closest to the ensemble. Um, and we use that uh, instead. So it's, it's not, again, it's, it's more of a heuristic than anything else, but it enabled us to have that conversation that it was about uh, sort of uh, mental health and, and poor baseline health coming in, for example, is to explain sort of the source of accuracy. Uh, but you found that that, that that wasn't as invariant as other, as other approaches? Correct, they weren't, they weren't as, uh, the trees that were clustered at the top performing were quite similar, actually, with like a few differences. Could it be that the sample size with 10,000 uh, data points? Could it be that it's just an artifact of that data set? You do it again in some other data sets? And that's one thing that we're trying to do for people that are interested. We're trying to actually now go through every single clinical trial. Can you do that? Because right now it's quite manual, actually. So that's why we're trying to think about a measure of centrality that to automate doing these you know, across hundreds or thousands of clinical trials. Um, I'm curious if um, at all you ever take into account sort of um, medically inspired priors about what constitutes a, a reasonable subgroup for the kind of phenomenon that you're interested in? Because it strikes me as an area where there's a lot of, you know, existing expertise about what makes sense as a subgroup. Correct, yes. Yeah. So, so I, I think there, there, there are two parts of that answer. One of it is that uh, everybody in my group sort of... Uh, we really try to embody this or embrace this notion of sort of theory-guided data science. So everything that we do, we, oh, by default, try to have a scientific prior uh, to whatever we do. In this particular case, we want it to be purely data-driven in the exploration phase because um, while you could compare it to other sort of uh, known subpopulations, for instance, uh, there, there are two problems. One is that the field of sort of population health and epidemiology focuses on these sort of risk factors. So they know like at a high level, like yeah, poverty and education and these things matter, for example, the, the, the social determinants of health, if you will. The problem is that nobody understands how and when do these manifest and how they interact. Uh, so it becomes quite difficult to have, uh, to find meaningful subgroups when you have interacting factors. People will know very well if you're over 55, you have a certain risk. Uh, but when you start combining these features, it becomes a little, these nonlinear combinations become harder to sort of ground in the literature, at least at, at the current time. So, th so we were mindful of it, but in this particular case, we chose to have a, a data-driven uh, exploration, but then when we put it in the Cox model, we put something that we thought made sense, and sort of we had an epidemiologist look into that as well, who's on our team. Uh, I have one question. So when we're looking at random forest, we know that they kind of tend to subpartition themselves. But you talked about the approach of finding something statistically significant, right? And since not you're kind of deciding the matrices on your own based on which you are collecting the final output from the top of the stack or from the get. So don't you think that a probability might occur that something which might not be significant would occur to seem to be significant when you're fo following such an approach. Correct, so yes, there's, for sure there's a, there, there are two risks. Number one is that you could create artificial subpopulations. And just because of this particular data set, the way it was collected, the, the luck that they had, there, there seems to be in the data an artificial population that, that is meaningless. Uh, number two, uh, there, there's the, there is a challenge uh, in the sense that you may be able to find multiple subpopulations and you don't know which one to choose, right? Some of them are real, some of them are artifact. Um, so for us to couch that particular issue, that's why we did the secondary follow-up analysis of doing the Cox model, is to take whatever hypothesis, that, so the, 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 the machine learning model, or the causal model, is not quote unquote deployed in production per se. What we actually deploy, it just grounds us, it gives us, well this is I think the segmentation that we need to look at, people that had these particular covariates. Um, then we fed it into the Cox model, and that's technically like the take home production model that just said, well yeah, it seems that people who be belong to this group actually fare quite poorly or quite better than the average population. So it's not a, a great way of doing it, but the fact that we sort of did it in two steps, 
reduces a little bit of our risk. We hedged a little bit that way. But ideally, yes, I would want to have some sort of confidence interval. And we provide confidence intervals. That's what one of the advantages of this, because trees cannot provide guarantees. I mean, Leo Breiman started trying to provide guarantees since that time in, in early 2000s, and we still can't. People have attempted, but it's not clear. But sort of what uh, Susan Athey did that's good is that she provides also confidence intervals in how she estimates these, these groups. So it gives us somewhat of a statistical aspect, but obviously statistical significance doesn't mean physical relevance, right? And that's why we, we feed it into the second step, which is this sort of survival analysis. It's not great, but it, it sort of was what we had at the time uh, and made sense sort of to domain experts as well. <laughs>